So we are starting a brand new series uh, I'm, I'm really excited about. It. It's, it's called Don't Be Fooled. And if you understand this concept of don't be fooled, uh, it, one of my favorite days of the year is April Fool's Day. And I, I, have, I have a reputation uh, that is so bad with April Fool's Day that I actually have a friend whose mom has set a, an appointment reminder on her phone uh, for every April 1st, don't believe Matt today. <laughs> uh, so I, I like to put together an elaborate ruse, if you will. Uh, one year, I was, uh, it was me and my business partner. We owned a marketing company. And what I did is I spoofed a news website on another d- a domain that I owned. So I took the website and I copied it over to my own website. And then I changed the news article to say that my business partner and I had been selected for the upcoming season of The Amazing Race. And it was just awesome. To, I posted the link on Facebook and comments started coming in. And if anybody commented anything around April Fool's, I immediately deleted it so they wouldn't ruin it for everyone else. And I just watched as people were just kept getting fooled. And my wife is the one who hates this the most because she's the one, she's getting texts also. And she's like, listen, I don't want anything to do with this. And eventually, the, the day always ends the same way. My wife calling saying, it's gone too far. You've been put on the church prayer chain again. So I would, I would post, you know, just kidding, April Fool's, toward, somewhere towards the end of the day. Great time. You know, April Fool's, it's one thing I can't really, I haven't been able to do it for the last couple of years because I don't trick anyone anymore. Everyone knows that every year it's going to be something super believable, but it's not. And that's the idea of this theme uh, for this sermon series, Don't Be Fooled. It's if we understand what the trick is, it's more likely that you won't be fooled. If you wake up in the morning and you have an alarm on your phone that says, don't believe Matt today, it's more likely that you won't fall for my tricks. And that's the idea behind this. You know, Satan is, is real. Evil is real. And Satan is a liar and a deceiver. And the best way we know how to not fall for his tricks is to know them. In fact, it says, this is our theme verse for the series in 2 Corinthians 2, 11. It says, Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. In other words, he's not going to pull one over on us. We're not going to be fooled because we know the tricks that he likes to play. We know Satan is good at this, even all the way back to the beginning. If you go in the book of Genesis, the second chapter, it says that Satan uh, appeared in the form of a crafty serpent. In other words, he's very good at what he does. And if you're not convinced yet that Satan is a liar, it can't be put any clearer than in John 8. It says, Satan has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Listen, it cannot be made any clearer than that. There is a real Satan, a real evil, that is trying to fool you. And if we can be familiar with his tricks as a church, we are better prepared to not be fooled. If you wonder why Satan does this, in John 10.10, It says the thief, this is Satan, his purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. In other words, he wants to steal your joy. He wants to kill your spirit and he wants to destroy your life. That is his purpose. Preferably your eternal life. He would rather you not ever know about the saving love of God. He would rather you never learn about Jesus and what Jesus did for you on the cross because he wants to destroy you. And the best strategy I know of to not be fooled is to know the trick. When a magician gets up on stage and he's doing some elaborate trick for you, if you already know the trick, if it's a trick you already learned how to do, you're not fooled by it. You know exactly what's happening. And if we know the trick... If we know how it's done, it's more likely that we're not going to be the one walking out the fool. Let's pray together. God, as we start this this series this morning, looking at one of the lies that Satan likes to tell us, God, I, I ask right now that you would teach this trick to us. 
That you would help us to see it for what it is so that when we spot it, when we see it, when we, we experience it, we will know not to be fooled by it. I pray that you would speak through me this morning, help my words to be clear, and that everyone here could be transformed more into the likeness of your Son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This first lie, we're going we're gonna to spend the next four weeks talking about four different lies. And uh, this week we're going to start with one that seems quite harmless. When I tell you what it is here in just a second, you're going to think, that doesn't sound like that big of a deal. But this lie is actually very, very destructive. And it's, it's called the lie of limited resources. The lie of limited resources. The idea here is that there is only so much of whatever it is you want to put in that blank. There's only so much blank to go around. And when we buy into that lie, it really messes us up. Uh, let me show you something. I, I went out this morning because, uh, who, uh, have you guys all had breakfast yet? Well, I got us the best breakfast ever, uh, some cold pizza. Let me get it. Yeah. So I got us some cold pizza from Papa John's, and I want to share it with you all. So uh, let's see here. All right, brother. Here you go. Some pizza for you and some pizza for you. Oh, man, I should have bought more. All right, hold on. I got an idea. Let me get that back. Let me get that back from you. All right, we got this. That's all right. That's all right. All right. I got a pizza slicer up here. Man, I, give me a second. All right. This is, you guys get the idea? There's only one pizza in this box. And if there were eight of you and I bought pizza, you'd all be okay. You'd be like, you know what? I get a piece of pizza. Probably not the normal, normal amount of pizza that you eat, but you'd be okay with a slice of pizza. But what happens when all of a sudden you find out that I plan to share this pizza with everyone in the room, what happens to your slice? It gets smaller and smaller and smaller because you understand that there is 100% of the pizza in this box. And if I am going to share it uh, 400 ways this morning, there is not enough for you to get really anything that's significant. You see, that's the lie of limited resources. There's also this thing called a zero-sum game. Most games that we play are zero-sum games. And what that means is that there is a winner and there is a loser. Another, another way of saying this is if the other guy is winning, what does that mean for you? You're losing. In a zero-sum game, in a, 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 in a world with limited resources, when somebody else is winning, when somebody else has more pizza than you do, you're losing. You have less. And this lie is so destructive because most of us don't even know that we have fallen for it. It happens in our subconscious. The funniest, that, that year that I put up that uh, Amazing Race joke on April Fool's, about six months later, the commercial started popping up uh, about the new season of Amazing Race, uh, the premiere happening soon. And I started getting text messages from people who never bothered to look back at my original post where I said I was kidding. For six months, I had a handful of people who still believed that I had been traveling and was a contestant on The Amazing Race. And they were reaching out to me to wonder, when is it going to premiere, and am I going to be on it? Is this my season, and all of this other stuff? They've been praying for me. I'm thinking, my goodness, this is not good. <laughs> Listen, that's what's so destructive about the lie of limited resources, is because a lot of us don't even know we've been fooled. We don't even realize how destructive this lie is because most of the consequences of this lie, the consequences of believing this lie, are happening in your subconscious. You don't purposely act some of the ways we're going to talk, but you think this way and you don't even realize it. Let me give you an example. Uh, when you've been fooled, in your subconscious, everyone becomes competition. It's just one of the things that happens. When you look at this world as a zero-sum game, uh, there's winners and there's losers. Everyone becomes your competition. The best way I can put this is if you are sitting at a Thanksgiving table and your family's there gathered around and you're about halfway through the meal and you look over into that crescent roll basket and there's only one left, everyone at that table becomes your enemy in that moment. Am I right? 
you want that crescent roll. You see, when we look at the world as a limited number of whatever, a limited number of pizza, a limited number of crescent rolls, everyone becomes your competition. You don't even realize it, but it happens in your head and in your heart. When I was in college, I, I, I was interested in my wife. I really wanted to get to know her better before we were dating. And there were some other boys that were also interested in my wife. Here's the problem in this, uh, the world of limited resources. There was only one Melissa. <laughs> and I wanted to get to know her. Uh, there was this other guy in my dorm who we were in the same prayer group together. We'd get together and we'd pray together. Well, he also had uh, kind of a, a, a thing for Melissa. And at one point, he called me into his room late one night. And he said, Matt, I want you to know, um, I, I have good reason to know that Melissa is interested in me and, and not you. So you're kind of wasting your time and bro code. Uh, you might as well just walk away and uh, admit defeat here. In that moment, Aaron wasn't a guy in my prayer partner circle anymore. He was now the enemy, my competition, because in a world of limited resources, that's how we start seeing people around us, and it is entirely destructive, especially within the church. Now, we all know how that story ended up, right? <laughs> um, anyway, um, here's, what, here's what Matthew 12, 25 says. It says, Jesus knew their thoughts. And replied, any kingdom, you could fill that in with any church, any family, any neighborhood, divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. You understand how this can be so destructive, especially within the life of the body of Christ. When we start fighting and looking at each other as competition within the church... When we start looking at the church across the street as competition, when we start looking at each other as competition, nothing good is going to come from that. It just causes disunity and not the unity that we're called to. You see, when we start thinking like this, we know something is not right because we're not called to treat people like competition. We're called to love. That's what we've been called to, church. That person sitting next to you that sometimes you think is your competition You've been called to love them. We see in John 13, 34, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Here's another thing that happens in our subconscious. When you're fooled by the lie of limited resources, you become most important in your head. Now, I don't think, again, that this happens in your conscience. I don't think that you stand up on a soapbox in front of all your friends and say, everyone, pause for a moment. I would like to declare that I am the most important person in this room. Now, you don't do that. Maybe you know someone who does that. Stop hanging out with that guy. But listen, people don't do that, but it happens in our subconscious. We start to put ourselves in this level of importance because when everyone else is your enemy, when there are winners and there are losers, Guess what you want to do? You want to win. You become the person focused on making sure that you end up where? On top. One of the phrases that I hate the most, it's a pet peeve of mine. When I hear it, I, like, I cringe when I hear it. It's this phrase of make sure you look out for number one. Who decided that you were number one? I don't see that anywhere in Scripture, church. And we put ourselves in this level of importance where the only person we're really focused on is making sure that we come out on top, that we're the winner. That means you have fallen for this lie of limited resources. Romans 12.3 says, Because of the privilege and authority given to me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. You see, we know something's wrong when you hear me say that you become most important. We all know as a church that the truth is that we are called to humility. We know that that's not quite right. Yet for many of us, that idea has seeped into our mind and we don't even realize it. 
Here, here's another thing that happens in our heads subconsciously. Su- subconsciously, it says, uh, w- when you are fooled, you deserve what others have. All of a sudden, you think you deserve what others have. Another way of putting this is there's a word that I believe becomes very prevalent in the, the vocabulary of someone who's fallen for this lie, and it's the word fairness. When you start walking around expecting this world to be fair, you have, you're, you're kind of showing your cards a little bit that there's a good chance you have succumbed to be fooled by this lie. When you come to this idea where instead of caring about the plate that's right in front of you, listen, if I have a plate that's right in front of me and I've got this incredibly warm, just beautiful slice of apple pie sitting right in front of me, the slice is probably more than I can enjoy eating because I, let's just assume I just had dinner and I don't have room for dessert. But this pie is amazing. What happens when we fall in for this lie is we take our eyes off of the pie that's right in front of us. The blessing that we have, and this is what we do. Why is that guy's a la mode? Why is this slice a little bigger? Or, (laughs) mine's a little bigger. Right, and we start to think about what's on our plate in comparison to what is on other people's plates. And we get this mindset that's all just, it's, 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 broken. It's not good. It's not healthy. I think that's one of the reasons, too, that social media can be so toxic if not used properly. Because you know what people put on their plates on social media? When you peek over at other people's plates on social media, I'll tell you what, they're putting the biggest piece of pie that they have. They're putting their best day, their, their child's best artwork. They're putting all the best. They're putting the, all the good things that are happening in their lives. Very rarely do you find someone so honest as to put on their social media profile the bad. And when you start looking into other people's lives thinking that's what 100% of it looks like, you are going to be depressed. We have to stop caring about what's on other people's plates because God has blessed us with exactly what we need right in front of us. You don't deserve anything. That's the truth. Philippians 4, 12 through 13 says, I know how to live. This is Paul speaking. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is a full stomach or empty, whether my plate has plenty or my plate has little, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So again, with this lie, we know something's not quite right because at the end of the day, we don't deserve what others have. The truth of the matter is this. We deserve nothing. There's nothing that we really deserve. If you look at what is on your plate, it was a gift to you from God. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. It was Him blessing you. And we look at what we technically deserve based on our, our choices in our life and the sin and the way we constantly focus on ourselves instead of the God who created us, the truth is we don't deserve a thing. Here's, a, here's another thing that happens in our subconscious. When you're fooled by the lie of limited resources, judgment becomes better than mercy. Judgment becomes better than mercy. And let me explain this. If you are trying to come out on top If you are playing this world, this life, like a zero-sum game, what's going to happen is, guess what? You start keeping score. You start to keep track of how you've been wronged. You start to, to keep track on who owes you this and who took that from you and all these things. And you start keeping score because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that whatever it is that you have one up on people around you. And you start uh, basically choosing judgment over mercy. Because you are so focused on fairness and getting back what is yours. Listen, I don't know what has been taken from you. Some of you, you can think of something physical right now. Maybe you made a loan to someone and it was never paid back. Maybe it was a, 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 a money. Maybe for some of you, uh, your dignity was taken from you. Maybe someone stole from you respect. And in that moment where the, you, you find yourself lacking in, in this lie with there's only a limited number of dignity and only a limited number of money and someone has taken yours from you, 
You start keeping score real quick and you withhold forgiveness. And you start choosing judgment and fairness over trusting a God who has unlimited resources for you. Because the truth is, God has all the dignity for you that you need. God has all the respect and love for you that you need. God has more resources than you could ever fathom. See, the truth is that mercy triumphs. That's the real truth, isn't it? God has plenty of whatever was taken from you. And if we're being honest with ourselves and we want to treat others the way that Jesus treated us, mercy has to triumph every time. Daniel 9.9 9 says, But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. You see the mercy over judgment. And then Ephesians 4.31 and 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. In other words, church, we are called to not buy into this lie of limited resources, not to withhold mercy, but instead to show it the way it was shown to us. And here's another thing that happens in our subconscious. When we buy into this lie, we start trying to save ourselves. This might not make sense right off the bat, but think about this for a moment. If you have let fairness into your mind, if you have let this idea of limited resources take root in your heart, the moment you do that, the moment you start thinking about things as fair and unfair, as balanced scales, all of a sudden you start to subconsciously hold yourself to that same standard. You start to think that it's important that if you're going to approach God, that you need to get your heart right. If you're going to somehow make things right, every time you do something bad, well, now i got to go do something good to make up for it. And we start playing this game where we're trying to earn our own, uh, our own way to heaven. We're trying to earn our salvation. And the truth is that that's not possible. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, God saved you by his grace. And you can't take credit for this, church. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you have done, so none of us can boast about it. We cannot save ourselves. The truth is, only God can save us. Right? That's, if, if we understand the truth, it's that only God can save us. And there's no doubt in my mind why Satan wants us to fall for these subconscious lies that are going on in our heads. The idea of a gospel that is slowed down and a people that are dis, uh, dis, disunit, have disunity amongst them and that aren't forgiving each other and don't have love for one another and are putting themselves in a the level of importance that they, they don't deserve. When a church starts doing that, Satan has fooled us. But here's the truth. God is a limitless God. And the solution to really understanding that God is limitless is to understand the truth, right? If we want to not be fooled, we have to know the trick. We have to know the truth in this case. The truth is going to outshine the, the trick, the, the fooler, right? And, and understanding the truth is so important. We see this in 1 Peter 5, 8, 9. It says, church, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. And then we see uh, in Ephesians, we, we talk about the, the armor of God. Do you know what the first piece of armor is that we talk about? It's the belt of truth. In other words, if we can arm ourselves with what is true instead of with what is a lie, we're going to be able to stand up strong in our faith. And the truth is this. Our God is an unlimited God. If you only want to write down one thing today, you want to take one truth home with you, it's this. Our God is an unlimited God. Because here's the thing. When we start looking at things in the natural realm, 
We start looking at things that are bound by, by physics and, and are bound by time and space and width and depth and the physical. When we understand and just look at nature, then we start seeing that there's only one Melissa and there's only one pizza and there's only one apple pie. And we start looking at things as if there is a limited number because in the natural, that makes a whole lot of sense to us. But we have to remember that our God is supernatural. He is outside of nature. He is outside of time. Isaiah 40, 28 says, Have you not heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. 2 Peter 3, 8 talks about time and how God is outside of time. It says, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. In other words, to God, he is completely outside of our understanding of time. If you think there's only a limited amount of time, not to God there isn't. Matthew 19, 26, again, looking at the truth, says, Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, say this with me, everything is possible. If we truly understand that, that point, that our God doesn't abide by the rules of, of nature, that he is super nature, he's supernatural, that he is outside of our understanding of time and space, and that he is an unlimited God with an unlimited number of resources, and that he is going to put on your plate exactly what you need and is best for you. He's not going to give you more than you should have. He's not going to give you less than you should have. He knows exactly what is meant for you. And that's what you're going to be provided. And you don't have to worry about it running out. You don't have to see things being put on other people's plates and think, well, now that's gone and, and now that can't be put here because God knows exactly what you need and he has 100%, 100% infinity more than any of that. He can continue to put more if he wants to. He is an unlimited God. Let me close with this idea. We like to, to use the word just when we're talking about the things we have. If you ask me what kind of car I have, you might catch me saying, it's, it's just a Chevy Malibu. If you ask me how much money is in my bank account, I'm probably, I'm likely going to say it's just, you know, whatever. And I'm going to tell you what I have, but I'm going to tell you with the word just because we like to look down at our plate and we see the, the, the what's missing. We don't miss or we, we miss what's there. When we think about this, hey Moses, what is that that you have? Moses probably likely would have said it's just a staff. It's just a staff to Moses. Hey David, what is that that you have? Oh, it's just a sling and a stone, God. Daniel, what do you have? I just have a little dream. Abraham, what do you have? I just have a little faith. Hey, little boy, what is that that you have? I just have five loaves and two fish. Listen, in the hands of God, the just that you have, in the hands of an unlimited God, God can do amazing things with it. Don't look at your plate and say, I just have this. Don't compare what you have to those on your right and to your left. If you do, you're buying into the lie of limited resources. We serve an unlimited God who has exactly what you need, and he's going to put it on your plate for you.